Massive thank you as always to our top tier patron, Sarah Turner. For as little as $3, you can gain access to patron-only episodes, as well as access to our Discord server, where we host weekly live discussions with host Ekoi Hero and myself. So if you like what you hear, come join us at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. We're on Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode or the podcast in general, then email it's not just in your head at gmail.com. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. The landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Today's episode discussion is sort of a response to an article, uh, A Beginner's Guide to Trauma Responses, which doesn't sound like a particularly fun beginner's guide to anything. But um, fight or flight is just something that just seems to be in everyone's language or understanding. But there are more than fight or flight. There's freeze and fawn and some other things going on there as well. And perhaps it would be a good conversation to have about these ways of responding to events and life and then how also that bleeds out into family dynamics and family estrangement and family trauma and yeah trauma and actually just as a sort of starting point you know the the way this particular article defined trauma or the way that they were sort of kicking everything off was talking about how your body in some ways automatically responds to a, th- a threatening situation at least a Per- the perception of right. a threat. So do, do you have like working definitions of what trauma is in, in your professional experience or is that up to the, the client to decide what they believe trauma is? Ikoi, do you have a ready definition? Well, yeah, I mean, it's trauma is how I would define it is generally like a, um, a stressful, hurtful, challenging situation that has, you know, that was not that, that the, um, person hasn't had the opportunity to process. Yeah. And it's also a jarring, disturbing incident, right? It could be sudden. It could be prolonged. Yeah. I think that's a very good description there. It can be sudden. Someone can be in a car accident. It can be prolonged, like the United States abandoning its people's health and so that they are lonely and feel like the society doesn't represent them anymore and their representatives don't resent them anymore and they're unprotected. That's a trauma. Right, and that's really interesting, the the idea that this... These uh, responses work on the individual level, but ultimately they work on a much bigger level as well. Yes. And I think it's important to repeat what you said, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and connect are all strategies for dealing with trauma, which is very important because trauma or trauma is ubiquitous now. It's everywhere. Can, can I ask what, uh, I, I guess we'll get into maybe just in a brief way what all of these things, just some sort of uh, explanation of what each of them are. But I was just wondering what the connect one was because I hadn't, I hadn't heard that before. What they, they got when they tested women and it's different from the tests that done previously, which fight fight or flight were male responses. But for women, sometimes when women are in trouble, they look for people to connect to to help. They try to connect with other people because other people are a source of support in terms of whatever is coming down. And that is a big response. It's why people organize in at work when they feel they're mistreated. And it's why when children are beaten, They look to connect with other children for comfort or they cry to the dog. They need to connect to something that understands and so that they feel less lonely from the trauma. Right, right. That's really interesting because the the other ones are very much about just what the particular individual is experiencing or how they sort of self... Uh, regulate or self, uh, you know, understand it just in in terms of themselves. Whereas connect is 
much bigger, right? It reaches it's out. It's much bigger. And fawning, they all have social ramifications. To fawn is to try to please your oppressor in order to get by. And the whole Frankfurt theory developed after World War II is that when times are traumatic, when you're responding to social trauma as the Germans were when the inflation wiped out the middle class and Germans were such scrupulous savers and they were wiped out. And when they lost World War I and humiliating and Germany wasn't the greatest anymore, they wanted to do what children do in an authoritarian family. They obey obediently thinking If I please the omnipotent father or mother, then I'll be spared. And they become super fawning and obedient. And that their analysis was that many of the German people who followed Hitler followed him because of that response to German trauma, even though he was never popularly elected. But still, he had a following. Because the, when you have an authoritarian structure in your family, then the way to get by is often to try to appease and fawn before the powerful parent who's abusing you. Right. It's really interesting as well that, you know, in, in this particular article, the fawn response, they say in childhood, this might involve neglecting or failing to develop your own self-identity. So how that fits into fascism is f- sort of fascinating, right? They provide one for you, like a cookie yes. cutter identity. And if you just follow along, then everything's going to work out, etc. And so does Trump. Well, I am a Trumpist. I I go to all his rallies. I wear the red hat, make America great again. That's who I am. And I'm great by association with the great leader. I mean, I think that's, that's you know, general, like, hardcore party adherent in general, right? Has, yes, it has is. That kind of, you know, um, because it's also kind of, it, it, I mean, it, it's it's the way that like in extreme forms, how, how cults maintain their, exactly. their memberships, right? Um, and, you know, it's not like a lot of times cults are seen as kind of like this extreme thing of like, oh, like how do people ever get caught up in these things you know right. because from the outside it it looks it, it's from the outside it can look very extreme but you know what they're just very good at is identifying vulnerable people in right. in moments of of weakness you know where people are needing support or and a lot of times you know i think one of the things about a lot of um, therapy and, and and working with people is that not having a sense of direction is an extraordinarily painful experience for people. Yes, it is. And I think it's very important. It's important enough that in Germany, post-World War II, they changed their whole system of child rearing. There, you know, there's a film called The White Ribbon that shows what pre- World War II child rearing was like. They used to call their kids lice boop and other things, the same thing as they called the Jews. And they had an abusive authoritarian child rearing method and the fathers were never involved in a tender way. And afterward, after the war, they instituted paternity leaves and all sorts of government programs to encourage tenderness towards children. Very, very differently. Right. To stop that. Because like the former, you know, child rearing that I remember uh, someone calling it like, you know, based on Prussian sensibilities. Yes. You know, being a very militaristic kind of style of of child rearing, right? Yes, Um, it was. And... Freeze, I think, is related, you know, their fight, flight, freeze, fawn, connect. Freeze is related where you just are literally dumbfounded. You stay there and whatever move you make, you think will get you in trouble. And so you just don't move. I remember walking into a hospital room of abused children 
who were very vacant. They were sucking on their bottles and pulling their hair or poking themselves at the same time so that they could have their mother with them, their abusive parent, by hurting themselves. And they were like little zombie babies because they were closed down. And sometimes when people are traumatized, they just close down. It's a way of not being there, going into a psychological coma, the way the body goes into a physical coma. If it's hurt more than the body can stand, it goes down inside to heal. And I think psychologically, freeze is going down inside to heal. There's too much so that you have to leave and you leave and dissociate, which is a psych word meaning go elsewhere in your mind to just blankness to escape. Yeah, they they had this um, other term, the flop response, which is exactly right. that. Like if, as they say, if you pass out, you don't experience the trauma directly. Um, so, you know, flopping is you just go limp, which, you, you know, you see a lot in um, uh, the animal movies. world as well, right? And then, yeah, yeah. and movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's um, right. Where they just lie there in an obsequious position, like, I'm dead. Leave me alone. I'm, I've given up. So that I think that's an important addition, that freeze, flop. Yeah, it's also interesting how the body does stuff that you don't necessarily control, you know, that it just, the body is protecting you, right? It's doing something right. you don't often, you know, in the, maybe in the, maybe it's only in these certain responses, maybe in the freeze and flop, you are taken over by your body, maybe with the fight and the flight, uh, that does feel a bit more like, uh, action based like you're doing it but maybe it's not maybe it's all just no. the body reacting a particular way and it just takes time afterwards to figure out what that was well one of the important things to know is the mind body is not really separate it's sort of a religious division that your the body and soul are very different no there's brain fluid all over your body and when you're in danger if you're going to fight your body releases adrenaline your immune system shuts off and every system goes into fighting you know that or well that, i mean fighting or flight right fight or flight right, is or flight. Adrenaline bit. right yeah so you're it's it's whether you're moving towards you know the the target or or you know or away from you know that's the, right the situation. so it, you know those can be reliant on like whether you tend to to be more of a dramatic accelerator type of personality where you tend to be more avoidant. That's right. You and know, even so. animals, you know, in a forest fire, the fox runs right next to the rabbit because every other system is shut down because flight right. is what takes precedence. Right. And it doesn't matter what's in front of you, you get out. And when people are in trouble, sometimes that takes over too. Every other system shuts down except the adrenaline rush that allows you to run. Right. You know, because like fight or flight is kind of, you know, the fight is seen as oftentimes like a literal aggressive altercation. But right. like the fight, fight, it could be like an example of that is like a mother that's, lift, that's able to like lift up a, a car from the adrenaline, right, to, to help to help her kids out kind of situation. Or, or a mom that runs into, a, or a dad that runs into, like, a burning building. Yeah, there was an incident of that sort. That's really right, Ikoi. There was an incident of that sort in Uvalde, Texas. There was a woman who wanted to rescue her child and started to go in the building, and the cops tackled her and put handcuffs on her. And then... She got the handcuffs off, went to the back of the building and rescued her two kids because right. she wasn't going to be stopped by the police. That was a real fight response. She was going to fight for her kids. And she did. Yeah. 
So, you know, it's not the fight isn't necessarily a negative thing because it's often kind of posited as, as, a, as more of a negative than a positive. Um, That's it's true. You know, right. And it's very contextual, right? These things are very contextual. Um, a lot of people also kind of tend to, you know, assume that like they, like, you know, a lot of times in therapy, you know, they're like, oh, like, you know, I'm really not a fighter. I'm a flight type of person. And, you know, and to a certain degree, you know, these things, these generalizations about self can be true, but it's also really kind of important to note that, like, especially if you learn these traits through, like, you know, your family relationships, right, right, that a lot of, you know, like, you could be both a fight or flight person, depending on the people that, you know, you are being reminded of. That's true. And the you know, one of the things that I found in my greater youth than I am now, being a good looking woman, is that if somebody bothered me, I went into fight mode. Now, I was a karate champion. I would scream and uh, get into a karate stance and shock them with the fight that they didn't expect. They expected fawning or flight from a bourgeois looking woman. And when they got this, you know, ferocious yelling and karate stuff, they ran. They took flight because I, I was ready to fight and they didn't expect it. A lot of what happens in trauma is the unexpected and one's reaction to it is often what we said, either fight, flight, freeze, flop, fawn or connect. And those responses then, presumably they have some sort of foundation in childhood but not entirely right like you you know you right. grow up you become an adult you have more experiences in the world you might react differently like you said equally like context dependent but i can imagine that there must be situations where people feel like they know themselves suddenly they're put in some sort of situation and they didn't respond how they wanted to respond right yes so shame must be something that happens as a response to some of these or things. Or later, shame because you did nothing about it. When I was horribly uh, assaulted, it occurred to me, oh, my God, I'm such a bougie little woman. I didn't know how to defend myself. That's why I took karate. And afterwards, I felt armed and ready if anybody mm. bothered me. So I changed because of my experience of trauma. And some people, because they fawn and they're outraged that they did, they change and become fighters or whatever else. You know, that there's people react as often an antidote to the poison of the way they felt they had to react in a previous stage of their life. Hmm. Yeah, that's Obedient really good way of putting it. children can become fighters. Right. Or oppositional. It's a little bit different, but yeah. Right. It's a different kind of fight. Also, right. I think, sorry, Liam, what were you saying? Well, just there's that whole idea of um, the, the script that you have for yourself, right? The, the life script or the, the way that you can conceptualize who you are and that these, um, these sort of typical responses, these default ways of reacting... Um, I can imagine being uh, really challenging or inspiring, right? Like you might, like you said, equally with patients, they they didn't necessarily consider themselves a, a fight person. But uh, what happens when you um, change the concept of who you are? Like suddenly you might have access to these responses that you never had before, and that could. I can imagine feeling quite empowering or the, just, you know, the opposite, it can be quite disturbing, <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, yeah, I, it, it's also one of those things where like, you know, the, the, it, it's one thing when people kind of, you know, come to a better understanding of themselves and their responses and, you know, or, are able to kind of, you know, adjust to be able to advocate better for themselves or or not like rely so much on on the reactionary response. But, you know, be be because the reaction reactionary responses aren't fundamentally engaged states. Right. They're dissociated. Right. 
yeah, you know, either way, it's like, you know, some, you know, it, it's not like, you know, your, you know, best cognitive self putting itself forward. It's everything else taking the reins and running with it. Right. right? So, um, so there is, you know, the tendency, for example, for somebody to, that was very like, you know, sometimes you'll see like kids that were picked on and were bullied when they were younger, like become like extraordinary bullies as they get older. You know, and that's not somebody advocating for themselves. That's still a reactionary response of, you know, like just switching places because of trauma, you know, versus like, you know, like, for example, with you and like taking mar- taking up martial arts and, you know, that's more of an engaged state. Yes, it is. You know, well, and I like terrified of myself, you know. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of like important to to understand that, like, you know, like if you have a flight, like suddenly getting, you, you know, becoming more fight isn't necessarily productive. Right. It could be, it could be just as reactionary, you know, and, and the point is the bully, to under, yeah. right. The point is to understand these situations and be able to engage with it. And to be able to kind of rein it in so that, you know, because ultimately these are all responses where you're not advocating for yourself. Most well, of if the you time. fight back, you are advocating you for are, yourself. Well, you know, and, and I think, that, well, like, you know, so it's one of those things where, like, for example, like, you know, is say, like, you know, and there are ways that, you know, the, the, there are nuances to that, right? So again, like, you know, if you are fighting in a way that's productive, surely, you know, but, but there are situations where like, you know, because I've used to work night jobs, night jobs kind of tend to you know end up in some hairy situations, you know, where I was sitting there going like, do I fight or, you know, like, I was able to have a moment where I was like, which one, which one do I choose? Do I run? Yeah, it was a conscious do decision. I act for, right. You know, we're like, you know, had I gone into like an automatic fight mode, uh, that would not have worked out for me. Right. It was Likely very, you have to make situation. a decision. Right. You know, and so ultimately it's one of these things, or even if it's kind of a split second pause, Right, because it's not like you can put yourself and go like, "Give me five minutes." <laughs> Got to this <laughs> right, so so these can be very quick, you know, things. Right, but you are still kind of you are not just going with you know the 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 flow of your adrenaline and your reaction. Right, that you're like trying to make a judgment in that split second. But what you can do, I totally agree, and I think that's really important, is that as therapists, we give people alternatives from being doomed to one direction. Absolutely. At the moment of additional trauma, they can make a decision. One of the things I did after realizing and start training in karate is I taught women's karate classes so that I could get women used to striding across the floor going and really being loud and strong so they'd have that alternative not that you always have to use it but we expand our alternatives and so in a moment of trauma we can come up with more than one doomed response and we have a choice because I mean the the one aspect of like the connect the connect is not like generally a response in the moment it's kind of like a response in the aftermath right you know so like the fawning and the flop or the freeze and the fight or flight tend to be much more of like what people do in the moment of of that that situation um, but yeah it's also like kind of really important to notice like where these things exhibit itself, you know, because I had one client that was like, oh, like, uh, I'm totally, totally, a, a, you know, a flight kind of, kind of person. But, you know, observing, like, they could be very aggressive to very specific types of people. Right. 
you know, and it was ultimately like, you know, like they had these responses kind of like based on, again, like who this person kind of reminded them of. Right. You know, so it's one of those. Yeah. Right. You know, or like, you know, a family role that they had picked up that they were carrying out. Right. You know, and so, you know, I mean, in in this particular situation, it seemed like, you know, the youngest child was kind of the scapegoat. You know, and so like, you know, his role was kind of like reinforcing the scape. He was kind of like the, the gatekeeper to the various statuses in the household being the oldest for the parents, right? So, like, with very specific women, he had a very high fawn-type response. To certain types of men, he had, like, a very flight type of response. And, like, to a lot of, like, younger, quiet people, he had a very, like, aggressive, you know? And these were all, like, you know, very different responses in one person based on who they were working with. Right? That's really important. I also think that sometimes among women particularly, the connect response is that when somebody bothers you, you yell for help and you look to other people. You know, I remember a client of mine told me that she was goosed on an exel- on an escalator out of the subway and she yelled, this man is goosing me, he's hurting me. And people helped her and said to him, you know, like, knock it off. But it was connect. Other people will care for me if I yell, help, I'm being hurt. And focusing attention on the person who is a victimizer. That can help also. And that's much more of a feminine response to connect with other people Right. Generally speaking, that, that kind of, you know, has to, you have to have an underlying kind of um, expectation that if you yell, that people will help you. That's right. To, to, to have that response, because a lot of people don't have that. Like, that's definitely not, not my, not my, my response in general. Like, you know, my, my tendency has always been like, I need to take care of shit myself. Right. You know, so, 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 so that type of like, you know, the, the immediate response of like connect is, is one that's, you know, kind of foreign to me, but one that, you know, is, can be extremely effective, right? It can be, and you can connect in different ways. Like I remember once when I was in uh, graduate school, some guy behind me goosed me. And I turned around and looked at him and it was a kid. He must've been about 14. And I said, why did you do that? And because I knew karate and I knew I could demolish the kid, I didn't choose to do that. I said, why did you do that? And he hung his head. And I said, did you want to feel like you could dominate me? That's sad. Get a hold of yourself, kid. And I think I affected him more than if I'd punched him in the face. But it's also true that I knew how to defend myself, which gave me the alternative of doing something else. Yeah, I have a a friend who was mugged, (laughs) you know, numerous times growing up. And, you know, now as a much older adult, um, has learned uh, self-defense and feels very much more comfortable uh, with the idea of being back in one of those situations that the not so much just having the skill, but but in how that they would respond, you know, to such a situation that because because in the self defense classes you are under a very stressful uh, situation, you're sort of training yourself to cope better with you know something scary, you know, someone's on your chest, you can't breathe properly, blah blah blah, etc. It's like over time he sort of has conditioned himself to um, handle. That those sort of potential panic situations in a in a in a completely different manner. So I think that idea of training yourself, which I, to some degree is partly, I imagine, what the therapy stuff is about. Anyway, it's sort of you're you're kind of training someone to deal with a whole bunch of things that are uncomfortable and suffocating in you know in some ways. Um, you're training them to be conscious in those moments. So they don't just 
um, freeze or a flop. Or, you know, they they are comfortable that they know that they've been they've thought of it before, and they know they have alternatives rather than in the moment of panic just doing something. If it's thought through on a conscious level, it's easier than if one is accosted and has to act without any previous thought. Well, and just going back to your previous point about the mind and body, this sort of fictitious gap between it, it's interesting as well that you can address maybe some of those fight or flight responses, as in the case of my friend, not necessarily through therapy, but through self-defense class, through physicality. Like you can, you can change your mind, your feelings through your body opposed to opposed to a sort of analytic pr approach um so there's options right. right well i mean you know these are these are like generally you know to a certain degree these are skill sets yes they right? are Just the physical skill sets are a completely separate thing from from you know skill sets of, of de-escalation and engagement um so yeah, can, can having more, I mean, even like, you know, just being physically in better shape, whether you choose to engage or run, right, puts you in, in a more better position to efficiently do either. Right, it does. <laughs> right, because that, that was the, that was one of the things of like, you know, I mean, during, during COVID, I got so deconditioned. You know, to the point where, like, you know, walking my my driveway is kind of on a on a pretty pretty, you know, not steep but like moderate incline. You know, and like walking down and then walking back up to the house, I'm just like, man, like, you know, this is a short driveway, and I'm like feeling it. This is this is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> this is really ridiculous. Um, and because you know, it's also just one of those things where like living in a wildfire zone. You know, there is a, you know, being able to move, whether it's like being able to like quickly move and grab as much important documents and things as possible. Those things impact like, you know, all, and alleviate some pain to the situation potentially, right? You know, like if I'm having to evacuate, you know, like if, I, if I'm so out of shape that I can just grab my cats and go, Right. Instead of instead of grab my cats and dogs and documentation and maybe, you know, my emergency pack that I keep packed. Right. You know, I'm going to be in a much better position if I can grab all those things. Yes. Yes. And the physical also affects the psychological. If you know you're in shape and you know you can fight, then you might not want to, but you know that you have that capacity gives you confidence because the, bo the body and the mind are such a, an integral units of one another that they can't be separated. Right. So one of the things that uh, this article talks about is it will have like bullet points for things you might have experienced in the family situation as a childhood and then how that is now manifesting, you know, as a, a young adult or an adult. Um, and I wondered if uh, in regards to this idea that the family sort of set the template for your reactions, um, A, you know, is that true? And and B, this idea of family estrangement that f from from these particular ways of responding to people then becomes a way of like, I don't know, maybe in later life being like, yeah, I, ca I can't be around. <laughs> I can't be around these people because uh, the responses that it triggers in me. I mean, sorry, that's kind of broad, um, but I just sort of wanted to take it generally in that direction. So if you have any sort of thoughts, immediate thoughts about what I've just said, um, I'm interested well, to hear. I do think that we learn who we are in this hall of mirrors, looking in the mirror of our parents' glances. That's the mirrors that we have when we're growing up, and they have a very powerful impact. So if being good meant being obedient, that has a powerful impact. Or fawning is the way to appease these people has a powerful impact. Then when you hit the outside world, you can change based on what you see around you 
That's why, you know, my self-defense classes and my karate classes were full of women who did had been brought up to be, quote, good girls and never fight back and then were victimized. So that you are set up in your family to react because it's the first society, it's the first mirror that you have to tell you who you are. And then when you leave and go into school and play outside, you learn differently from the people around you and you make different choices. And that's why political movements can be very important learning centers like the women's liberation movement was or black liberation movements are what you you might have learned to be fawning and obsequious and you learn, no, I have other options. So we do have, they have a strong impact, but we can go beyond them if we work on it, which is true of all family dynamics. Right. Right. I mean, ultimately these things are, are skill issues, right? Like if you have a, if you have an extraordinarily reactionary response to somebody that something, you know, whether it's people or situations or whatnot, you know, generally what that points to is that, you know, you were usually not in an environment to ever be able to practice, you know, um, you know, that's one of the major aspects of like things like, you know, for example, like, you know, borderline personality disorder. A lot of the colloquial understanding is is like somebody that's just like born broken. That's just, you know, these people are like born nasty, terrible, broken people. Which is um, a terrible yeah. thing to say. Yes. It's a horror, you know, and and a lot of times what it is is like you know these are people that have never really had the opportunity to practice like good relational behavior. Is is basically what it comes down to, you know, whether it's narcissism or borderline or or any of those you know maligned behaviors, often comes down to just you know lack of practice, lack of good practice. They had nobody that was giving them good examples, and they did were not in an environment to practice them. So same with all these kinds of like you know reactionary responses, right? That like you never had you know the opportunity to be like okay, like when do I fight? When do I fight? How do right. I get? You know, how how you know? When do I like you know? I mean, because you know, fawning to a certain degree, I think like fawning is one of the the biggest responses for people in therapy, right? That can really impede therapy. Yes. More so than like fight or flight, you know, in my opinion and in my experience. It completely gets in the way, right? They're just trying to please you. And that's not the whole point, right? The the point is to connect with themselves. Right. You know, rather than like, and you know, it's, it's, Oftentimes, like, you know, one of the things I think about, like, for, you know, drug rehab, it is really common in if they offer formal therapy um, at all. You know, it often comes in the form of interns who are very inexperienced. You know, so they've just gotten out of school. They're doing their internship. And, like, I don't think any amount of supervision really makes up for, like, experience with working with people. Yeah, you know, and so a lot of times, like, whenever, like, you know, I, because I have, you know, a couple of friends in the past that had, like, really heavy fawning tendencies, you know, and it was just one of those things where whenever they went to therapy, you know, it's just like, there would be, they would feel good about, like, having the space to talk to somebody shortly. Right. But at the same time, like they just were never made like improvements to, you know, the goals that they kind of set out to 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 achieve in therapy, whether it was like better relationship with people or whatever else. And a lot of times I would kind of like try to figure out like what's going on here. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're fawning a lot to your therapist. and Your therapist isn't catching on it and isn't trying to like correct you on this. That's what it is. You know. Right. And it's very, that's very destructive because they're trying to please you instead of figure out who they are. Right. Also, people's families set them up. 
with a set of responses that were necessary in the family and are actually very harmful when you leave. Right. I had right. a client who illustrated this beautifully. She had a dream where she was behind a medieval castle wall and it was a, a wall that had a huge door with spikes on the outside and she felt very protected until she realized that the spikes grew in and she was impaled on those spikes and it was about her family system she felt it protected her to be completely withdrawn and obedient but in the outside world she was impaled on that defense system and she had to change it so that we adjust to the society of the family that requires bizarre stuff from us and then have to readjust and help and therapy be is a help in that readjustment right yeah there's a there's some quote i came across recently whoever feeds you controls you <clears throat> and uh yeah th that to some degree is the family yes it right. is i mean they they, they house you they feed you you know they're your yeah, survival I mean, oh your your entirety of your life is you know for a significant time of of you know, people's lives, right? I mean, you know, if we say like 80 is, you know, a long life, right? Mm -hmm. Then like a quarter of your life, the quarter of your most formative part of your life is to a certain degree, like completely dependent on parents. Yeah. Right. And this, this is one of those things that is always sort of fascinating was like, and the school essentially just becomes another sort of family circumstance and then after school it just becomes work you know you just replace sort of mummy and daddy with the teacher and then the boss <laughs> um and right. it feels like <clears throat> to some degree to what degree you know is there an escape from any of those structures right there right. There, there isn't it's just about how you um <clears throat> uh navigate it in the sort of healthiest way possible i don't know i mean i'm sort of interested to hear what what you think to that idea of uh um because no. certainly you know for me being self the self-employed thing was like i don't want to go fucking i don't want to go sit in an office like i just did right. that at school right. you know <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right you know it comes with other downsides but you know uh, yeah i'm just sort of fascinated to hear what you think about the idea that school is just home again and the work is just sort of home again. Well, if you come from an authoritarian family to an authoritarian school system and in an authoritarian religion and an authoritarian society, you don't change your strategy. And mm. one of the challenges of a therapist is people devise, devise survival strategies because their families are where they need to survive. And that's the hardest thing to interrupt what was a survival strategy right. because the survival strategies you have at home are not necessarily going to help you survive once you leave. And that that's a huge thing. And so the survival strategy in school is obey the teacher maybe, but right. you know, blind obedience when you get into the world is a big mistake. I mean, I think that's the difference between, like, you know, a healthy family dynamic and an unhealthy family dynamic, right? Is that right. a healthy, healthy family dynamic, you know, is like one where, like, the parents are able to, like, you know, guide and provide structure and, and, and give, you know, help children practice good skills that, like, once they go out in the world, you know, kind of add to their life, right? Help make connection easier, help make friends and, you know, community easier for them. You know, because that is ultimately the, the main aspect of, like, coming from, like, dysfunctional, chaotic, abusive, neglectful, or a combination there of families. Ultimately, what that usually ends up being for children is, like, you know, a difficulty in finding and maintaining and stabilizing relationships and community for themselves. Right. You know, is, is kind of, you know, the, the ultimate, you know, negative aspect of why these, you know, uh, maladaptive skill sets that's learned in family is so destructive is that it kind of primes you 
you know, it primes the children to grow up to be more isolated adults. Yes. And sometimes, you know, I have a client who was brought up with a very abusive father and he totally devalued her. But when she got to school, the teachers loved her because she worked so hard and she was so smart. And she learned to count on her smarts and to completely never count on another personal relationship, particularly someone close, never to count on them. And always to keep her finances and her smarts as her protection. But we adjust to our families because we're abandoned to them, at least in the United States, which we don't have universal quality childcare. And so much depends on your family, whoever got pregnant, no matter who they are, no matter how incapable, you have to depend on them because they're your survival. And that does warp an awful lot of people. Yeah. Those strategies. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Yeah, it's, and that's that's a, it's, it may be a good place to wrap up unless you had other things. The idea that just, you know, ultimately yeah. this is all about survival strategies and those survival strategies are so ingrained, but they're exactly right. the things that can lead you into trouble. <laughs> uh, they worked at one point, they might not work anymore. In fact, they may endanger you, you know, and so it's a conscious grappling with your survival strategy and practicing alternatives and so you're not doomed to where you survived in childhood which may be inimical to survival later on right i mean and it's it's you know part of that like desire for connection that people have you know when they come from abuse um and neglectful situations is that it primes them for trauma bonding yes it does because they look for what's what feels at home, what feels familiar and familial, which is a curse. Yeah, you know, and so it's oftentimes, you know, um, when when working with people, like they often, you know, they may have had multiple relationships, but it's not uncommon to see people like, you know, basically play the same role and have a partner that played, you know, the same role, role, you know, similar role over and over and over and over again. You know, when you kind of see that kind of pattern in people, you know, it's often trauma bonding where it's like, okay, like, you know, this person, your, your partner is either your mother, your brother, your, you know, whoever, you know, that, that your role that you associate the strongest with your role. Right. You know, and like you're kind of playing out the same scenario over and over and over. Yeah, because, you know, one of the things that like a lot of times is negated, right, because we are assumed to be rational creatures and not emotional creatures. When we are emotionally creatures that, you know, have to have a certain level of stability to be rational creatures. That's right. We do. And it's what what you're describing is Freud's repetition compulsion, that you keep repeating a pattern in order to make it different. But because it's the same pattern, it's not different. Right. And it's also, I think, you know, the the fact is that we are much more primed to to prefer predictability. Yes. Over over something new, right? Something new. Familiarity. Familiarity is an intensely strong foundation for everyone. You know, this is just a human survival again like these are survival mechanisms that have been become maladaptive right yes you know familiar is kind of important you're walking around the forest you know you have you know berries that are familiar in front of you and like berries that are completely you've never seen before which one are you going to eat right you know familiarity you know being fond of familiarity is is kind of a vital protective mechanism right it is and it uh, isn't it's also yeah. an endangering mechanism it can it's be, it, it, it can it, be both. both it can be both yeah. you know but but we are primed to you know yes kind we of, are yeah gravitate towards right and so that's why like you know those patterns they can you can't break them you know it's just you know, it is something it's that work. can be, 
yeah, it, it's it's difficult to do. You know, it's it doable, is. but it's difficult to do. So, you know, I think a lot of times when people, you know, because that's kind of where like the victim <laughs> blaming goes into a lot of domestic violence type situations, right? Yeah. You know, where like people are just like, you know, because it, it's 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 common to hear families and close friends often be kind of like exasperated at like, oh man, like, you know, it's she just keeps getting into the same relationship, the same situation. Right. I I don't know why she just can't, you know realize this and 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 break out of it. You know, Joseph Conrad has a good quotation in Heart of Darkness where he says every state has its own equilibrium even madness and to leave it is terrifying. The more unstable you are, you know, the more you're going to grasp for towards familiarity even if it's a bad ending, you know what to do with that bad ending. You know how that's going to end. It's familiar and familial. The words yep. are similar. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Do you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell, and Sheena Belmas. If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.